Hello and welcome to the Park Stop Podcast. My name is Alicia Stella. With me as always, my co-host Ian. Hey, kids. And we're we're introducing a very special episode we recorded a few weeks ago with Dave Cobb, creative director for Men in Black Alien Attack, where we talked all about the ride and got in-depth uh, in our premium podcast series. Yeah, Dave was awesome. It was super fun. We have lots more episodes of the premium podcast available and ready to listen on Patreon. Uh, but now here is our episode on Men in Black Alien Attack in its entirety. Enjoy. Have fun, kids. It's awesome. Hello and welcome to the Park Stop Premium Podcast. My name is Alicia Stella. With me as always is my co-host Ian. Hey kids. And today we have a very special guest to talk about Men in Black Alien Attack is the creative director for the ride, Dave Cobb. Howdy. Uh, I am extremely excited for this one, for this discussion. Before we even started recording, I told you I'm I'm not going to stop gushing about this ride. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. I'm already stumbling over her words. I know, I can't, I can't, I just can't. <laughs> I mean, Ian, you were, you just you just saw Dave on, on the Discovery Channel, right? I did, He's I just like watched famous. the Discovery Channel, yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please. Yeah, that's uh, that's like the that's like the infant version of Dave Cobb back then. I had a full head of hair, and man, yeah, I watched that video, and I'm like, that was, was that, what? No, that's not, that's not, that's not 20 years ago. Come on now. I, actually, yeah, it it opened April two thousand. So, yep, like yep, actually yep. twenty years. Um, that's kind of crazy. Um, crazy is. because that Universal would let a ride stay in their park for twenty years nowadays. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Yeah, we lost a lot of our classics, and I hear people saying like, "I wonder if they're going to redo a minute." Like, you stop right there. Don't you dare finish that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I have people ask me that all the time. Like, are they gonna are they gonna revamp it or turn it into something else? And I'm like, I haven't worked there in 20 years. Like, they don't call me and tell me. By the way, <laughs> hey, here's what we're doing. Um, they, they don't call you up and run it by you. It's like, listen, we're gonna no, replace the big TV. We want your no, approval on the big TV. No, it's not gonna fit no. in the egg just right. So we want you. No. <laughs> No, my, my opinions mean precisely jack and squat to them. But uh, I'm still grateful for the. Uh, opportunity for having done it you know like you said there's not a lot of things in in theme parks in general that last that long and yeah and we did certainly did not design it i mean you're always trying to design the best possible attraction right you want something to be a perennial but we didn't think that while we were doing it this wasn't like we were like all right we need to make the thing that's going to stay in this park it's just it, it, it we just did the ride we wanted to ride so i'm very grateful that it's lasted this long and it has the fans that it does but if given the chance, would you add anything or change or upgrade anything? If from oh where god, it is right that's now? a that's a that's a really hard question because like yeah. you know mm-hmm. yeah sure there's a million things I would lo- like to go back and do differently or or, or fix because I you know um, you you only you only see the flaws in working on a big project like that you're your own worst critic um, but at the same token a big project like that is like. Uh, it's kind of like raising a kid and sending him off to college. Like at a certain point, it's not yours <laughs> yeah, anymore. Of course. Um, the, the day it opens is and actually, you can always tell and ask anybody in the industry, they'll, they'll tell you this. There's a moment around opening, usually after when you're finishing up things and doing punch list items. And so, you know, checking boxes and making sure everything's documented, right? Blah, 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 all that stuff. Where all of a sudden there's a security guard on site who doesn't recognize you. <laughs> because he because he hasn't been there for the whole production he's the park the new park guy and he's like can i see your badge and that's the moment where you're like all right it's not mine anymore but you know the the, the flip side of that story is the very same thing that happens as you watch people coming off the ride and enjoying it and realize oh it's theirs it's not mine at all anymore it's theirs that's rad so this repl- this replaced nothing. This was uh at the time in the in the late nineties, the mid to late nineties, I was so upset. Like it took me a decade to get over that Jurassic Park the ride got moved from Universal Studios Florida <laughs> yeah. over to Islands of Adventure because I had to wait. It's like nineteen ninety five comes rolling around and Universal Hollywood gets their Jurassic Park the ride first and I'm just fuming and I'm like, How dare you cancel my attraction? I've been waiting my whole life for this though since the movie came out two years ago. And 
But now looking back, it's like, it, that's the greatest thing that could have happened because we might not have gotten the men in black alien attack ride had Jurassic Park been built there. Um, <laughs> well, it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, that was absolutely uh, intended for the site for sure. It was uh, the original, mm-hmm. but the original, original concept art sort of shows it shoved in the corner, back corner, which is still actually an empty lot. It's that space between MIB and, um, uh, the Simpsons and back, uh, the former Back to the Future, and so it's um, uh, there was all it was always going to be an attraction, but yeah, Iowa sort of um, uh, changed those plans, and and key to that that actually becomes key to why Men in Black happened, um, right? Because they about a year out from Iowa opening, um, they realized, wait, when Iowa opens, we're going to have this whole new resort with hotels and things. And the studio park, we don't have anything teed up a year later as a new attraction. And so they sort of fast-tracked this. It was a very sort of a rushed discussion. They were so busy with not only IOA, but also USJ, that um, it just, the, the, the analysts that sort of went under the radar. And then some one day somebody went, wait a minute, we need to do something. And so that's how I got the job was um, the, the industry was so swamped at that point because um, you had my way you had usj you had hong kong disney animal you kingdom animal kingdom uh, dca um uh, so it's just oh um um, um took, took a disney sea so you had mm. like it was the i mean think about it there was, there was three or four years there where it was like the new golden era of new parks being built <laughs> and so um uh, the business was really 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 busy and i was working at landmark at the time and perfectly happy as a show writer but um was friends with Phil Hedema, who used to be the VP of creative development for um, the parks, for Universal Parks. And uh, I knew him through the Gay Men's Chorus of LA. I sang with them and it was sort of a creative and social outlet outside of work. And as I was coming out in the early 90s, it became sort of one of my key things because it was this incredible group of 160 men of every size, shape, color, creed. Uh, what you know, it was it was like the best coming out ever um, in that group because very supportive. And one of those people that was very supportive was Phil Hedema. And so I helped make shows for the chorus with him. I helped you know make giant foam puppets and and big black that's light awesome. puppet, that's puppet awesome. numbers. Yeah, because he, he if you don't know, Phil came from um, one of his early jobs was with Sid and Marty Croft building puppets and costumes. And so. Um, we, the Game Men's Chorus, in addition to singing and, and doing our normal big choral numbers, we were known for doing these big staged puppet numbers. And I built puppets and performed them with Phil. And so he got to know me, you know, he got to know me personally. He got to know me socially. He got to know me sort of creatively through this. And then also, while I was at Landmark, I actually pitched projects to him across the table on the Landmark side. And because, um, you know, at the time, Universal used to like Landmark did um, the original concept for T2 and Spider-Man and Jurassic Park and a lot, a lot of early stuff. Um, so they were uh, one of the, you know, they were sort of the think well of their day, as it were. And so he invited me into lunch one day and explained to me this problem of we need something like yesterday in, to start to the, the opens a year later after I away for the studio park. And. Uh, he's like, I know it sounds like I'm, this is, he says, this sounds like an, an insult. There's like nobody left in the industry. So I'm coming to you, <laughs> but, but, but he's, he, he, yeah, I'm like, thanks question mark. No, 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 no. He was very sweet about it. He was like, no, this is actually the really, this opens up a really perfect opportunity. I've seen your work at Landmark and I really think you're ready for this. And so he was the one to kind of in, uh, invite me to make the jump from show writer to creative director and thus mm-hmm. begat MIB. Thankfully. So, yeah, when when um it was a popular movie, obviously um in the the mid to late what is ninety seven ninety six ninety seven summer summer, summer ninety seven is when it came out, and that's when they went after the license when they when, when ah. they realized they needed attraction. It rated so high, and they wanted something for the studio park that was a movie. Gotcha. And so uh, um, they they approached in the same way they had approached. Uh, other companies for you know t2 <laughs> uh and later on <laughs> harry potter and transformers and all that the uh um they went to sony and got the license for maybe um and sony didn't really have rides so like this was no. new for the uh uh did you know while i'm thinking about it did barry sonnefeld the director have anything to do with the attraction or did he approve anything i know spielberg was a creative consultant for universal 
Yeah, no, uh, Barry Sonnenfeld did not. I would have loved to have met Sonnenfeld. I think he's a genius, but uh, was not involved. Um, Spielberg was, however, because he was one of the producers of the film. And and more importantly, Spielberg was a creative consultant to the Universal Parks. Oh, yeah, that's right. He actually executive produced the movie as well as uh, creative. Okay, consulted for the park. And so, yeah, the Universal creative at the time um, uh, would... Uh, and this was part of the process with Phil that he explained to me. He says, at a certain point, you're going to have to take all of the work in progress and take it down to Amblin to Stephen and present to him. And that was like one of the, the thing, first things he said about the job before he offered it to me. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> um, <laughs> I got to talk to who? <laughs> I got to, what the, who's it? What's it now? So, um, uh, so that happened, <laughs> which was um, uh, am- amazing. That happened about eight, six or eight months in. So we had maquettes and a track plan and a storyboards and I had to pitch it to him and, and you know, it, everybody goes, Oh my God, what was that like? Well, it was kind of exactly what you think it's going to be like. Like you've seen him in interviews and behind the scenes. He's very personable. He's very passionate. And, you know, I'm a, at that point, at that point, a 28 year old, nobody who, who is in a room with Steven Spielberg <laughs> and, and, um, you know, we've got 30 minutes is the, and his assistant was like, it's a hard 30. We were, we're out at 30. I'm like, great. I got the pitch down to like 22 minutes in the Q and a, and he enters the room. He's laser focused on you. He's very a beat, but he's, his attention is on you. And when you are pitching, it is all about listening. Like he is the most attentive guy to other creative people. It was very, very gratifying. And 30 minutes turned to 45 and 45 turned to 60 and 60 turned to almost 90. He kept waving off his, uh, his assistant saying, no, 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 I'm changing my meetings. I want to stay here. And, you know, at 28, that's ridiculously affirming that you're on the right path and that you're doing good work. And, and he had a million notes and that's what Phil warned me about. He's like, take notes because Stephen will have 20 or 30 suggestions that are each going to cost you two or $3 million a piece. <laughs> And he's like, but the, but the drill is we look at all of them and Phil looks at it and narrows it down to here's the one or two we think we can do and present it back to Stephen and he'll be he'll be cool. But just just say yes to every just yes and you'd use your improv training. Yes and everything, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of people that follow the theme parks nowadays uh, take for granted the whole Spielberg connection. It's like, oh, he just collects his percentage every year at the door. And like, he he's not really part of it. It's like, he had a hand in all of the attractions for those first 10 years or so at the Florida oh, yeah. parks. He wanted, Very like, so. he, I used to walk around the park um, right after Men in Black open. I'd be like, Jaws, directed by Spielberg, Men in Black, executive produced, Back to the Future, executive produced, E.T., directed by Fievel, uh, executive <laughs> yeah, produced. Right. Like, this half of the park is the Spielberg yeah. half. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm eternally grateful for having that experience pitching to him so early in my career because it really gave me a good lesson in, in just uh, engaging with senior creatives, engaging with executives, and that not all of them are going to be jerks and the ones, and you have to sort of lean forward and listen to the ones that are giving you the same respect. And so, uh, he was, uh, he was amazing. He was, but, but again, I, I sort of say he's exactly what you think he's going to be. He's a cool guy who believes in creative people and wants to hear their voice. And so it, it was, uh, all systems go after that. And, and then if you want to know the, the, the things that he suggested that we yeah, I was just going to ask um, what's like yeah. some of the things that made it in and what didn't make it in that he suggested. Um, well, he, um, originally the, uh, well, let's see the, the biggest one would be, he wanted Frank the pug somewhere. Oh, nice. He's, he, oh. he's like, where's Frank? And we're like, oh, right. Well, that's of course, like he's a fan favorite. Why wouldn't we have him there? So he's not animated or anything, but he is there. We decided to make him a, a more of an Easter egg. So if people don't know, he's on the right side of the right track in the locksmith shop, just like he's in the movie. And it's right after, or really during the um, the, the, the crashed uh, prison ship. Yeah. So it's kind of behind you. So you have to sort of torque your head around to find him. But he's there, and he gets you a lot of points. Because he's um, only in the first movie for a couple of minutes. He becomes right. a more major character later on in the sequels. But at the time, right. he was just a little, right. almost like a mini cameo of a dog talking. <laughs> yeah, he was the he was the, the he was the the back the police informant, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, from a, from a Agent noir, J is like. A dog. He looks at this weird, creepy guy. He's like, oh, this guy's not even pretending not to be an alien. And then the dog yeah. starts talking. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And then the other thing the other thing he, he said was, I want to be an alien. And, 
And that's why we have the newspaper aliens that adds up. on the bench. Um, and when it falls, they're holding a, a, a stick with a Spielberg. Spielberg head on it and an Amblin cap on, you know. You know, in the movie, um, when it shows uh, all the people that like are aliens that are being followed by the MIB, Spielberg's one of those people on the big oh, screen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yep. I, yep. I always thought yep. that was an Easter egg tied to it. But the fact that Spielberg demanded it, <laughs> like, I oh, want to no, be yeah. an alien. <laughs> like, now I know how it ended up in the movie. <laughs> yeah. So we had to do we had to do a scope. He wouldn't he doesn't do like there's no uh, um, life casts of his face or anything. He, and he didn't want to, and he wouldn't do one. But um, so we had uh, a sculpt made and he had to approve it. And like, <laughs> you know, and then so all of that. All of that was his idea. And then little tiny things, to be honest, a lot of, lot of little suggestions about, because we showed him um, maquettes and drawings of aliens that were in process. So we hadn't really built any of the aliens yet, but we showed him all of the drawings and there were, you know, we designed hundreds upon hundreds of different aliens and narrowed it down to the ones that you see um, from differing, differing levels of some of them are just, you know, flats with glowing eyes up in windows to fully moving uh, characters down at, at, at ground level and everything in between. And um, so he had a lot of tweaks about those gags. And one of the most gratifying things he said to us when I showed him all of this stuff was, he said, God, this really reminds me of all the little gag drawings that somebody like Mark Davis would do for the Haunted Mansion uh, Pirates. Oh, nice. And I'm like, no, no, you could see literal cartoon he- parts over my head as he said that. Because <laughs> like, it, it, because frankly, that's what we were going for. Like we really looked at the park, the Universal Studios, and we knew what was happening at Iowa across the street in terms of attractions. And Phil and I had, and, and Craig Hanna and, and, and John Murdy and all the people, because John worked on this in the early days. So, uh, Craig did as well. Um, it did not start with me. It started with them, actually. Jen Sauer, who was famous for The Mummy. And, um, so the, 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 the group of people at the table um, early on, um, early it was going to be much more of a thrill ride. And I'll talk about that in a second. But, but the... <laughs> The, um, the, what really came out was MIB is about the aliens, right? It's about the, the, that fine line, as I said in the Travel Channel special, that fine line between funny and scary. And somebody in the room, I, I forget who, it might have been me, said, well, yeah, that's kind of like the Haunted Mansion. And we all went, right, Universal doesn't have their own Haunted Mansion. And in a way, this was trying to be that. It was transporting you out of the real world in an elevator. That was not an intentional copy, but it was like we, <laughs> it's a we do, serendipitous <laughs> accident there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because but 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 we realized once we get into that world, we want it to be about this colorful collection of vignettes. Right? It's a vignette ride. It's it. it my favorite description of Haunted Mansion and Pirates as dark rides is that story wise, they are a cocktail party. Right. That story wise, they're not a linear thing. They're there's something you just browse through and you pick up snippets of dialogue. And each time you go through it, you hear different people at the costume party or, or the cocktail party and you notice different things. And so I love that aesthetic and I love that it's they're really more operettas than they are sort of linear stories. And so we tried to have the best of both worlds. We knew we wanted a linear story. We knew we wanted a call to action and a beginning, middle and end. But within that, uh, um, we just did all these really great vignettes and the, the artists that did those sketches, like we had um, people like Don Carson, who I don't know if you know him, but look him up. He's amazing. Um, he was one of the chief designers of Toontown, uh, legendary former Disney Imagineer, works with Phil a lot now. Uh, a great animation background uh, and layout artist named Cynthia Ignacio. She did a lot of sketches. Um, and then we had just creature designers like crazy, like four or five of them d- doing different creature designs, including, um, uh, um, Neville Page, who you all know now as the, one of the co-hosts of Face Off, and he designed, you know, the the, the new uh, creatures in the new Star Trek movies. He designed the Cloverfield monster. He designed all the creatures in mm-hmm. Avatar. He designed um, all the vehicles in Minority Report. He designed the Tron helmets and costumes. He like his first big Hollywood gig was Men in Black. <laughs> <laughs> was my ride and, <laughs> nice. and, and and he was a superstar talent in sort of uh, industrial and toy design before we met him phil brought him in because phil saw his work and he was a, a, a teacher at um uh, art center i believe was it art center he's a teacher at one of the art schools and uh where, where phil was as well and so he brought him aboard and so i always joke I'm, with him now I, I talk to neville every once in a while we have lunch a couple times a year and i'm like i can't afford you anymore <laughs> <laughs> Um, that actually brings me to my next. I was going to ask about the the ride system and the ride car. Didn't he uh, help design the look and aesthetic for the actual ride vehicle? 
He did. He did the the ride vehicles and the guns, and he did about half of the aliens, including the big bug. Um, oh wow! I, I would say he did the more major aliens, the ones that are are larger or more. Um, I, and I, I could go through and pick out the ones that he did, but the main one he did was the big bug, and because that was a tough one. Like, how do we, how do we make it look not like it's just a bunch of rock work, you know? And because um, because <laughs> yeah. we knew we couldn't afford every last piece of it moving, so it, Universal did tout it at the time as the world's largest an, animated figure, which is mm, shorter. Um, but you know that's marketing. <laughs> um, um, no, the vehicle, he did do the vehicle and the gun designs, and that took a lot of uh, iteration. The, the, but going back to what I said about it starting out as a thrill ride, early on there were concepts of this um, that I was not involved with. There were blue sky, con- there were two or three blue sky concepts thrown around. One of them was like a coaster that had onboard guns, which was never going to work. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Um, wh- Hitting what you they, in the what face they, as you go down a yeah. hill. <laughs> yeah, they were like hard mounted, like like turrets. But oh, you know, okay. But at high speed, they, they just yeah, realized no. that's this is never going to work. Um, but originally, it was going to be because they they knew they had a short development time. They wanted to use an existing ride vehicle, so they used that initially. They had earmarked because of how excited they were about it. They earmarked the Spider Man vehicle, and so when I came on board, the Spider Man vehicle was in the Blue Sky concept and. One of the first things we did was we went over to Spider-Man and set up laser tag targets and rode the regular <laughs> ride with laser tag targets and tried to shoot at things. And it was freaking impossible. And, <laughs> and, shocker. And, it's a freaking shocker, right. And it's, so it's like, well, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it was one too many things, the added movement, you know. So we said, well, we want a little bit of a thrill. So what do we do? What ride vehicle do we use? And again, they were like, we would really love to use an existing one. And so Cat in the Hat, somebody brought it up and we went and rode it and played with the spin and how fast it could go and how many kind of, and how it can change direction. And then we realized, oh, but that gives this, this the same uh, advantage of of Spider-Man and even the Omnimover and Haunted Mansion of being able to direct you and point mm-hmm. you at things. So that, that really became the real reason for it. The thrill became secondary. We knew we wanted a couple of wee moments, but nothing crazy. Because at the end of the day, it was it was going to be about the gameplay, and so the, that positionable vehicle also gave us a, a stronger way to to tell a linear narrative amongst the chaos of allowing people to look everywhere and shoot everywhere. It took me several years to realize it was the same ride vehicle, like because it's such a different experience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That it, that at some point I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> like it finally occurred to me, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, so but the 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 spinning has been decreased on the Cat in the Hat ride. So I'm glad that we still have the Men in Black experience to still get the full spinning. Um yeah. and I'm you know, for all those people that hate that they took down the spinning on Cat in the Hat, it's like that's so that little kids can go on it, you know? Yeah. Like I yeah. get why they did it. And besides, Absolutely. we have the men, we have the Men in Black for the older kids. Like it works out that way. <laughs> <laughs> but you're trying not to spin on that ride so you can get the points. Well, right, there's, and there's parts that, that spin regardless. Yeah, sure. I know, but yeah, there's a couple. The of, there's a couple of hard <laughs> spins. The, the the funny thing is that actually became a point of of uh, an interesting point during playtesting. So we we got the you know the ride running most of the stuff in. We're starting to program the rides and playtest. And what we realized was if you were really good at the game, you had a really <laughs> ride <laughs> <laughs> because. <laughs> <laughs> because if you if you were so good that you hit everything, nothing. Because the whole original idea was you can shoot them, but they can shoot back, right? That was right, the, right. Big, the big change. The, and we the, realized that can't happen with all of them. It only that has to happen at, at a couple of places. But even those the few those few places were like the big smoke smoke blast guy uh, yeah. after the the crash and the guys mm-hmm. looting the pawn shop on the left. Those are the two big first spin moments for both tracks. Mm-hmm. Those were originally optional. Those were going to be a timing thing of do you hit them, do you not? And if you hit them in time, you don't spin. And it and it just disappointed people because they weren't spinning. And they saw the other vehicle spin, right? And so it, it became this careful thing of the only place we're really going to put the variable spin is when the vehicles are shooting at each other, which right, is a whole exactly. other which is a whole other thing we figured out later on. That tunnel was not originally that. That tunnel was originally the super speed moment from the movie. You hit the red button and went fast. Well, wasn't and one of the ideas for the ride vehicle to be the car, the 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 car, the, the don't push the red on. button car that yeah, you the drive POS, around the in? Ford, the Ford right. POS, yeah, um, <laughs> yes, and and there was no way, you know. Um, uh, Neville was the was one to show us that on that chassis there was no way to get that down to 
to design it within that the small framework of that ride vehicle and the proportions of it would have looked weird. It would have looked very, he did it one, I think he did one napkin sketch that I never kept of like, here's what that might look like. And it was, you know, it looked very chibi, if you know what I mean. It looked like very cute, kawaii, like, you know, Japanese design version of the Ford <laughs> clunky car. It looked, you know, it didn't look, it didn't look like it fit in the MIB world. So we, that's when we said, nope, other direction entirely. This is a training vehicle. It will make it look like alien tech and, and yeah. go a completely different direction. I, I really like the um, sloshing fuel tank in the back. I don't think people oh, notice I, or take like really take that in as that's just brilliant. <laughs> I fought, I fought and fought and fought for that because liquid inside of, of something like that, you know, the concern is how do you seal it? How, does it evaporate? Does it get gunky over the years? It's like years? a wave machine. I stare at that thing when I'm in the at waiting. <laughs> it's a, <up> mode. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's like a it's like mineral oil or something that's been taken. Yeah, it doesn't go bad. Exactly. But 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 just but I fought for that because we were like it's got to look like you know alien like you, it's something weird anyway. So I'm glad it's still there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so interactive system the the guns. Uh, so that's always, since you came onto the project, that was always a big thing. It was going to be an interactive ride, uh, mm -hmm. which there, there weren't that many of back then. Like nowadays yeah. we're getting kind of used to it. It's becoming the norm almost for new attractions, some interactivity. Uh, but back yeah. then it was definitely kind of like cutting edge, so to speak. Well, I think there what were two, I was going to say that I think there were two at that time. There was one on one on an early, early Sally one called like Turkey turkey shoot or something i forget i'll look i'll look it up there was oh, one yeah. from the there was one from like the like the mid 80s um and then of course buzz lightyear and so buzz lightyear was the only one on the map and, and they had just opened the florida version of it which was the mounted guns yeah and well it's, and, it's, it's if you had wings turned into a an interactive right. ride uh, right, or right. delta dream flight excuse me um yeah. <laughs> You had wings, had wings, had wings, had wings. <laughs> and, um, and that, that ride, ride annoys me to no end because I have to spin the vehicle to face where I want to face. But then also <laughs> it's it's an omni mover, so it's also moving the ride vehicle at the same time. And it's like, stop it! I just moved to face the way I want to face. And <laughs> yeah, and exactly. and then the mounted system and the, my thumb hurts from the the button. And then all the Z's. Um, I, I hate the Z's. Uh, I think I heard you talking about how you didn't want to have targets to shoot yeah. at. You wanted yeah. to just, and I love, I think if, if you went on the ride and didn't want to interact, it's still a really good dark ride, Men in Black Alien Attack. And I think that's why it succeeds as a ride and also succeed as an interactive ride because it technically oh. is a good ride on its own. I Thank agree. you. That's that. That was a very much a goal. We were like, you know, somebody's grandma is going to get on this and not know what to do with the gun. So we need to make sure she has a good time too. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah. I appreciate that you noticed that. No offense to something like Millennium Falcon, you know, Smuggler's Run or something. But if you don't play along with that, you're <laughs> yeah. not going to have a good time. <laughs> like you have to keep jamming that button if you're in any of the seats, or it's not. Well, everyone's going to yell at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, so, and I think that I think a ride like that, in terms of interactivity, is going to blossom when they have more than one mission. Right. Right now, it's oh yeah, it's I the agree. Same one. And so, if the promise is oh, eventually they're going to have eight or ten, like a like down like DLC on your on your PlayStation. Great. So, or even uh, having uh, interchangeable cool. sections the way that they do on Star Tours. If like if right. it just all of a sudden went to a different situation or turned yeah. right instead of left, yeah. I, it would yeah. blow my mind and I would enjoy it so much more. But. Um, yeah. So the interactive guns, it's essentially, because this is 20 years ago, it's essentially laser tag technology. We see a laser, but that's just for pointing, right? It's actually infrared that's doing the Correct. target, uh, uh, like the, the actual uh, the, point mm -hmm. allocations. Yeah, it's basically a it's basically a TV remote with a laser pointer attached to it. Is all, it's the, <laughs> nice. the um, okay, yeah, infrared. Uh, fun fact: the company that designed the gaming system, meaning the games and the targeting and and the scoring, was uh, the same company that did um, uh, Buzz Lightyear. Um, it's a, a company out of uh, Dallas called Heads Up Technologies. They do high end aeronautic technology, like plane stuff. Um, but they had this little side business that rolled out around Texas that they became a provider of laser tag equipment from the laser tag arenas. And so they were, you know, one of the people that showed at IAPA every year. And uh, so because they had done ride vehicles and they had done Buzz Lightyear, we engaged them and said, all right, here's what we want to do different. And one of the biggest ones was Men in Black is about holding the weapon, not mounted to the vehicle. So we got to be able to hold on to it. So we have to keep that in, in mind. 
And the, uh, the, the target thing was an interesting one because we had a lot of philosophical discussions about that. The thing about Buzz Lightyear that is always sort of difficult the first time you ride is because is that you get, you get laser focused on those Z's and that's all you look at. And you really don't notice anything else until the second or third or fourth ride, which is not necessarily bad. But we were like, is there a more creative way to, to, to telegraph that, where to shoot on these things? Um, that that doesn't have to be a single place, and so th- one of the biggest challenges of MIB is that each of those aliens is covered in sensors underneath those hard skins, with with little little you know a mesh of coverings mm-hmm. over these infrared sensors, and there's dozens of them on some characters, and that's why we train you in the queue. We're like head to head to chest, basically. Don't worry about running out of ammo. That's why we say in the queue, you won't run out of ammo. Keep shooting. Here's mm-hmm. where they're most vulnerable, and we hoped that that would come across for people, well, and they would especially, get that. You know, it takes three or four hits to knock some of them out, and then yeah. like like the big guy with the smoke gun, like he, he falls over if you hit him like six times. So you got to keep yeah. shooting. <laughs> yeah, and and but that that be, that became a long term issue in terms of maintenance because all those little mesh screens have to be blown out of dust or else the game becomes unplayable. Like all of those characters need a lot of care and attention because the the targets themselves are physical and, 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 and if we were to make that ride today, that wouldn't be a problem mm-hmm. because the way that these rides work today is camera tracking. So in addition right. to the, the, the gun that you're shooting, you have these cameras looking at the set and you can literally on a screen draw, here's where a target is and here's how much it's worth. And it be, just becomes a, 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 a camera sensing system. And so if they were to upgrade the, the ride, that'd be the first thing that they should do. I'm sure is, something is like, um, more modern. A uh, Marvel's new Spider-Man ride where you web sling. I'm sure something like mm-hmm. that is using more just all camera technology, sensing where your hand is and then extrapolating right. where you're going to hit and then giving you points without any need of sensors whatsoever. Just tons of, you know, mapped cameras everywhere. Um, right. I, you know, I went to uh, Legoland, Florida, and they have the there's like an adventure ride where it, you can, you use guns to shoot and they have the same type of infrared uh, sensors, but they don't have the meshes over them. So you can see these mm. like big black dots on all the characters in multiple spaces. <laughs> and like, <laughs> and it really makes you, makes you appreciate how much work and effort went into the theming of uh, men in black alien attack to keep the aliens, you know, completely covered and fleshed. And, uh, and, and knowing that they have to go blow out like the dust out of the little mesh holes like that's that uh, kind of blows my mind but it, but it, that's the technology at the time and you did the best that, you know with it well, and i'm glad well we did talk about for a while that the, the the option would we said if we do have to put a target on what can it be in world can it be in the story the z's in buzz lightyear are lightly that but not really right like what could it be in the mib world and because they were all prison transport escapees we thought what if they had like a prison collar on yeah. Like a big metal thing with an obvious big red light on it, then or big green light on it. Then when you shoot, it turns red, like it locks them back up. And that was discussed for a while, but then because all the a lot of the aliens had been designed already, it was like, well, where do we put it on them? And that's this added layer. <laughs> this one doesn't have a thing. head, <laughs> right? He doesn't. He has an arm, like he's just one big eyeball, just like, a tentacle in a go? window. What, where does it go on that yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. So that that idea fell by the wayside for that reason. It just didn't become practical. So we sort of said, all right, let's stick to our guns and stay this course. And and to be honest, it's one of those things I look back on and go, I. I think we did okay. And, you know, as you're telling me, people love the challenge of the shooting. I still think for beginning players, I would have loved to find a, 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 a better clue. And I think with modern technology, we probably could have done something either with video projection on top of them um, mm-hmm. or something like we, that's another little fun fact. Um, one of the things we found in playtesting that people wanted was feedback when they missed something. Yeah, and we do yeah. that. With, we do that with audio. There's there's a there's a, a shooting sound and then a shoot with a hit. Right? Um, people wanted to see something, and that's kind of impossible. But we did do a, and this is ninety eight technology in terms of cameras and video projection, which for you kids in the room, that's very expensive and very small. Um, and we did a mock up on a section of scenery that we called what do we call it? The missed hit initiative, and it was this uh, quick and quick and dirty mock up where we. Um, had a camera f- looking at one of the sets and we had a video projector on the same set and went where it saw a 
uh, um, an infrared dot from one of the guns that was not a target. It would animate a pre-animated little sprite of like a little splat. Yeah, with like a and, Rise of the Resistance has for all the missed exactly, shots right, coming from right. the stormtroopers. Exactly. So we were thinking about that kind of projection mapping way back in 98. And, um, and, but then you apply that to the entire square footage of the ride. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was like 20 or 30 or million dollars to, to oh my cover God. the ride. So it was like, at the time, video was that kind of video to cover that much space in video was really hard and expensive. So it, it went away, but we were thinking about that way back then. And now you see it in attractions all the time. Does the back of the gun have a a red and a green light? Was that yes? Yeah, that became miss and hit. So when you fire okay. and it and it would just be red if you fire and because it is a infrared is a two way beam. When you basically all of the characters in the ride are sending out a signal saying I'm here, right? When your infrared engages with that character, it immediately sends back to the gun in, in, at light speed. You got me. And so the the trig the triggering of the character of that you got that score is not through some wiring up through underground and up through the ride vehicle. It's literally in the air through the infrared beam. And so um, it's uh, 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 and that's how we have a game system on board. The, the vehicles knows whether to use the red or the green on the back. Right. So you have something there for people to know that they missed. No one notices it, but it is there technically. <laughs> yeah. 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 Aim far, uh, kids. Aim far. I learned that from the special. <laughs> I always aim for the windows and I get most of my score from these two or three windows in the right after the uh, jail, the jailbreak scene. Um, But they added, and I don't know if they were always there, but they added curtains that open and close on and they'll stay closed at a certain point until your cars get out of the scene for the next one to go. I got nine, 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 nine. Um, a few years after the ride opened, and I have not been able to get it again since those curtains went up there. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen? Have you seen? There's a there's a, a, a club on Facebook. There's a Facebook group called um, What is it? Am I? I'm, I'm looking for it right now where we're talking. It's called the MIB 900 Club. Nice. <laughs> oh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and it, they've got like almost 2,000 members, and they're all like pass holders. This uh, one of the guys that runs this guy named Nick, and he reached out to me. And, uh, um, and, you know, said, Hey, we have this club. We're big fans. We we hope you can join us. So I do. And it sort of lets me keep tabs on, uh, all the fans. But what's amazing is like all of them can max out. Like I can't max out. I couldn't max out 20 years ago. We thought we had, (laughs) we had said it to something that was pretty impossible to do. I had Um, to ride 10 times in a row. I worked there. Um, I worked at Jaws and I, um, I was actually cross trained there. So one day after work, I I asked the fellow team members, like, can I just keep going? And they're like, well, you have to get off. So just come back around through baby swap. And I was like, okay. No problem. And I, 10 times it took me and I finally got straight nines and then they put curtains a year later. <laughs> womp womp. Uh, I do like how the the lighting effects like the um like the the like starburst lighting on the windows to to give you like and there's a sound effect of a window breaking like to, to like so yeah. you know you actually cuz those are flats in the window. Uh, yeah. But to create some kind of effect, like, yeah, you got me. Like, there's a big flash uh, gobo light type thing and the sound effect and, um, right. like, right. other ones, aliens will fall over and stuff like that. So I love that there's actually reactions. It's like the old shooting gallery in Adventure La- or Frontierland. Like, it's something that's interacting so you know you hit something. Yeah, and, and that, and that you know, how we addressed all the targets in terms of that was, you know, think of it like a menu, like A to E. Like, A would just be a lighting change. B would be, you know, uh, a lighting change with uh, a, a, a one axis animated thing like the curtains. You know, C would be a character that has one or two axes of motion. D would be four or five axes of motion. And E would be a complicated AA that has multiple moves like the, like the, the guy in, in the, the last scene. Oh, um, the guy in the last scene, by the way, with the hot dog cart. Right, that's going. Ow! Oh, hey, what are you shooting at me for? <laughs> the ricochet um, sounds just over and over again. <laughs> sounds, yeah. That's, first of all, that's my voice. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. So, same with the. I'm also the voice of the tailor at the end. It'll be ready really? next Wednesday. That's, nice. That's, me. that's all I ever hear um, now. No, you know, because I'm the best. <laughs> um, and and I'm the voice of the not the talking worm, but the one going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The one but, listening in the in the break area in the break room, yeah. The guy that did the voice of the worm, the guy that did the voice of the worm, also did the voice of um, the, um, the 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 coach alien in the middle the middle ending. 
Um, and he is also the voice of Spider-Man across the way at IOA. Oh, um, nice. But um, yeah, you know, that alien, it, in, it, he seems so big and, and he's got such great movement. It, it seems a, li- a weird, if it seems weirdly out of place in that scene, like where does he come from and why is he so important? Part of it was we wanted to keep your eyes off of looking over at the, uh, at the, the big bug about to turn the Right, corner. right. But if you look at his spacesuit, look at it very carefully next time you ride, because you'll notice it has the same design cues as the crashed spaceship in the first scene. He was originally that weird orange guy that pops up out of the wreckage at the front of the ship. Mm-hmm. That was originally the guy in the suit. Whoa. He was originally up there. And it, it, as we were placing characters, we realized... Oh my God, we're, this is a scene where we're opening up the world and it's the first big reveal of the street and people are going to be looking everywhere. And we're putting this big complicated character where nobody can see him. And mm. on top of that, he, and on top of that, because it was a, a, an attraction that went from nothing on paper to opening day in, you know, 24 months, 23 months, um, uh, it, it didn't fit. <laughs> We had gotten to that point where it was like somebody, <laughs> oh, somebody made a, somebody made a measuring error and it was like, Oh great. We got this big expensive. Doesn't the, fit here. doesn't the ET screaming sound play when that first one pops up? When it's like, it, 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 it's, it's a scream. It was not taken from ET on purpose, but it, it's from some sound library. So it, it may well be, but it's uh, not that it wasn't done. Con- it, it, it's, it wasn't as soon done as you said it, it like popped into my head and I'm like, that sounds like ET. Um, so now we have like that. It's kind of like an empty space. You put something very uh, uh, like complicated to look at to distract us from turning our head because it's there's no aliens over there. That's except yeah, for the, but, the the two eyeballs in the wall above him. Uh, there's yeah, not but, much to look at. So that's brilliant, actually. I, and I, I wish everybody could hear each of the individual alien voices and noises that their their attract mode and their hit because they're all different and they're all weird and funny. My, the hot dog ones are my favorite. They're actually like they they they're like they, they're they're like chittering like little teeny little baby aliens on the way up, and then when you hit them, they all in harmony like a three part harmony go hot dog. So <laughs> it, 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 and oh, and here, here's another uh, little tidbit: um, the voices of the aliens are all over the map. They're everybody that they're they're me and the sound guy and and library sounds. There's not like, like you know there's not one person that did all of them, but one of the people we did bring in to do a to just record lay down something for all the aliens and one we would use and modify is um um uh, michael winslow the guy from police academy the guy oh, that no way. Voices in police <laughs> academy yeah yeah he um he was a friend of the people of somebody at sound deluxe who were the company that did the the sound uh, engineering and design for the ride and evidently he if he's not, if he doesn't live in florida he go, he goes there a lot for some reason and so we uh, we had him in, and I would literally just from the booth, I would bring up on screen uh, if, if for him. Here's what does this guy sound like, and put up an alien, and he uh-huh. would riff. And so I spent like an hour or two with with Michael Winslow making weird, funny noises for our aliens. So he's in there. I can't really tell you which because I don't really remember. But it was it was a lot. He made a lot of noises, and we kludged him together with lots of other noises to make everything that you hear in there. But it's cacophony, oh you know. I, I wish crazy. people could hear individual things because we tried to mix it as best we could so that there some of that some of each alien cuts through the chaos. But you know, it's kind of impossible in a ride that scale. Well, you have the like there's each sequence has its own like main character almost alien, you know, whether it yeah. be the, the guy with the big gun, the, the the butt alien. What's up with butt alien? <laughs> <laughs> he, he became like a main character for the attraction. <laughs> oh yeah, he uh, yeah yeah that that uh, you know what's not funny about shooting somebody in the butt? Come on now, <laughs> or it looks like a head, and then you realize no, that's his butt. No wait, his butt. That's is a exactly head. right. It's exactly right. That's the whole point. And that you know that that that's because me and Craig and Hannah are twelve year olds, so we thought it'd be funny. That's the way to be. <clears throat> um. What you you mentioned that the 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 scanning portion where the other car is filled with uh, bugs, what was that? Oh yeah, you mentioned it was going to be the the a speed tunnel, like a screen, like the like yeah, a, it was gonna uh, be... like like the Disney does often, or actually did with the Buzz Lightyear because it was the old Delta Dream Flight thing, like that yeah. type of thing where you're going through a yeah. speed tunnel. Yeah, we it was going to be like that, and we realized in Buzz Lightyear it you, they get away with it because it's a kids ride and it's and it's cartoony and it's not supposed to be real. And we looked at the viewing angle of that hallway that we were going to be pulling through. First of all, the, the two, the tracks side by side, 
is a um, is difficult because of the size of the reach envelope and the, and the size of the motion envelope of both vehicles next to each other, just made all made literally the whole building a giant runway. Right? There's it's, we tried really hard to create moments that feel intimate, but in reality, the the the, the size of that ride track is huge. And so um, when we got into that, that's about the closest we we got it as close as we could, and. You could see out both ends of the tunnel, even if the vehicles were turned sideways, because we didn't have um, viewing protection like you do on like the Spider-Man mm-hmm. vehicle, where the, you've got you know um, blocks on the side. Spider-Man is very like an Omni mover; is very specific about what you're allowed to look at. We didn't have that, and so the original idea was we were going to pivot you sideways to look at the wall and have fans on you, and then much like the flu powder effect that ended mm-hmm. up in in, in um, Harry Potter and, uh, uh, and the Forbidden Journey, it was going to be a projection that followed you like you were zooming down the tunnel. But, you know, we, we all sort of talked ourselves into it during concept. And then as we started planning, we're like, that's going to be cheesy. That's yeah, but you, but you added another interactivity that, you know, that's shooting the, at the other car is such a fun thing. Exactly um, right. And so so <laughs> that's the thing. With that, we went, well, what can it be? And then we went back to, the, as we were game playing, we're like, well, this is a big stop in the gameplay. The biggest problem is we were, we were hoping people would stop playing the game in this spot. It, but, you know, they're not. Once they're shooting, they're going to shoot at whatever moves. And, and then some, <laughs> again, it was one of those things where it's the proof of how um, collaborative these things are. Somebody in the room went, well, what if we shoot at each other? And I, we were like, what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, so we, you know, we, we went to the game guys and we went to the ride guys and is this possible? And so we went to Neville who had already designed the vehicle and we're like, can you add a little thing on the back? And, uh, so he came up with ideas for the little stick and I, I, I just named it the most, um, Star trek uh, you know, stupid non-tech name I could think of, which is fusion, fusion exhaust port. And, <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Perfect. Sounds like it comes out of Wesley Crush's voice, right? On the deck of the Enterprise. <laughs> Sir, the fusion exhaust port has remodulated. Uh, anyway, um, he so yeah, and that and we realized how powerful a moment that is because it literally is this palate cleanser moment mm-hmm. in the game, and it's the perfect. If you look at it from a, it's just one of those things where we did not plan it to be this, but I look back on it now from a pacing standpoint. If you look at cinematic structure, it is a classic end of the second act or beginning of the third. Oh. Yeah, no, and not only that, it disables your gun, so it gives you a breath, which nowadays, yeah. only just now are rides really starting to realize we need that moment, whether it be like Flight yeah. of Passage in the cave. Like, before we get to that third act, before we get to the climax, we need a right. little breather to catch our breath, right. and then we're going to go into it with guns blazing. And I and exactly. I love how this ended up being that. Um, and, and, that the, and the beginning of the third act is a completely different dynamic of, oh, crap, now I'm on my own. Like the, the stakes are raised because of the other car. Like <laughs> shooting at each other becomes this fun, unpredictable thing uh, in, in that little construction site scene. So, yeah, it was, um, it was a, ha- not a happy accident, but it was proof of how these things are not all designed on paper on, in the first phase that as they develop, they really develop and you realize, Oh, that's not going to work. That's going to change. It's more like theater than it is movie making. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're sort of adapting things as you go. And that was one of the bigger successes of the ride was that scene. Um, online, there are arguments about whether or not shooting your own exhaust port is uh, cheating or not, but I don't nope. even shoot it uh, any, I know you're for it. I, I'm not even going to ask I'm you totally about it because I, I know you're for it. Uh, I saw you answer that on the live stream uh, back in April, but I turn around and shoot the eyes on the movie posters because I don't even want to oh. participate anymore in your shooting shenanigans. I am just going to get some points on these eyeballs. I like that. That's nice. That's like the, the pacifist angle. I, I, I agree with that. That's good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to block you from shooting those things. <laughs> So wait, um, does it take two hits to get it to spin, or do no, you not? Just one. Okay, because like the other day, it took two hits, and I was like, I saw the little exhaust port do its little animation with the LED lights, and it didn't spin the first time, and I got angry. <laughs> that, that that might be that might simply be that might simply be ride logic that the the, the ride motors weren't ready to make the turn because they uh, were in the middle of another move or something. Who knows? But okay, the, the okay. intent the intent was one. Yeah, the intent was one. Oh, okay. That, I like that you have a logical explanation for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just shoot your posters. Stop complaining. 
Uh, <laughs> let's. I want to talk a little bit about the story. I love my posters. Mm-hmm. I love all the eyeballs. I, the, the eyeglass <laughs> ad. The, uh, the, there's an eyeglass ad. Those eyeballs. Yeah, there's eyeballs in the little parking meter. If it's an eyeball, I'm shooting it. <laughs> um, the story. The universe and you uh, relocated from the World Expo. <laughs> the, uh, the, was it, is it 1964 World Expo? I know it's it, it's technically supposed to be the World's Fair, but we're we're gonna it's universal, so we're gonna pretend it's the World Expo. I like that they changed it just yeah. slightly. Um, yeah. Well, that's because the part of that part of the park was called World Expo. Well, remember yeah. back yeah. to Back to the Future and right. the food, International Food Court were supposed to be a movie backlot version of a world's fair pavilion. Right. Like it's and a weird, that's a weird, you know, they backed into stretch. that scene. It's a for stretch. Sure. It's a stretch. <laughs> yeah. But we were like, well, now we have a chance to actually really solidify that. So let's do it. Um, by the way, the international food and film festival was my jam. <laughs> and I liked the terrible <laughs> ja- Chinese food and pizza that it served. And I was actually yeah. sad when fast food Boulevard <laughs> took over. Unlike everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a bad pizza loving man. Yeah. Well, I still have my comic strip cafe, so it's all good. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> same food. Same food. Oh. Uh, just as awful, just Killing as delicious. Me, yeah. um, Killing me. No, but I heard that originally, or one of the ideas, I think Wikipedia says originally planned, it was going to be the Orlando <laughs> International Airport as the design for the, the, the ride idea. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, so the, we knew being Men in Black, it had to have a bookend, right? There's no way it can be Men in Black in the real world. That just does not jive, right? We started designing the the architecture from the outside um, to be very sort of googie in 1950s, 60s. Um, originally, though, we one of the concepts that was thrown out was to literally make it the battery vent and tunnel building from the movie, right? The big square box with the, the hallway mm-hmm. with the fans in it, right? We had, that was well into concept, um, well, almost into schematic as we started to break ground. That, that was going to be the entry, but we realized that building is so brutalist and industrial and it, and it works when you see it in the milieu of New York, but New York is, you know, uh, six blocks away from us in the park, right? It's right. Not I was going to say, if that was in New York, you know, that would be yeah. one thing, if but we put, standing right, in the middle of the nowhere. Writer, Right. If we had put the ride in New York, the New York Street section, it would have been great. So we started to talk about what else it could be. And for a while, we wanted it to be a non sequitur, that you got into Men in Black training through some secret door of whatever this building was going to be. But then at the end, it's like, oh, welcome to Orlando. Like that was one of the early concepts. And and it was like a there would be a luggage carousel and it would have not only human luggage, but also like weirdly alien looking luggage. Um <laughs> There was, there was a version um, that was because at the time Universal was owned by Seagram's. Uh, we the ending was, and that concludes your tour of the Tropicana Orange Factory. <laughs> and 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 you would get off the ride and it'd be like you know signs that say free orange orange juice samples this way, and like you would somehow teleport it into that. And um, and there was one where in that whole exercise where it was like. We came back and it was a sort of a small world finale, but but like cultures of the world, which would lead us back into the International Food Court and the World Expo, f- you know, site theming. Mm-hmm. Um, but none of that really landed. It really didn't. And we realized the reason it, none of them worked is because they were so left field. It had to, for, you know, whenever we design these things, yes, big fans of the movie are going to understand what a neuralizer does, but my grandma might not. So you, <laughs> you have to appeal to, swimmers way you have to appeal to what we call waiters swimmers and divers right it's the engagement pyramid 90 percent of your audience are waiters they're going to dip their toe in they're not going to know everything about what you're saying to them and the middle of the audience is you know fans that have seen the movie once or twice that will swim around in your in your world and, and enjoy it and then you have the divers like you who go and find every you know detail and know every detail and, and there's even a a layer below that we call them mer people because they've been <laughs> super young. And, and we prefer to be gills. called the 900 club. Thank you very much. <laughs> they've, they've grown gill. They've grown gills. I'm, whatever you do, something is going to piss them off, but they're also your biggest supporters. So, you know, um, anyway, it's um, because of that, we realized it really needed to be a true bookend. We needed a setup and a punchline. And so 
That's when, and that's again how these things happen. It was in this conversation about the building because we knew what the base building was going to be, but the front was still under concept. Mm -hmm. And the architect was the one who threw out, well, what about like a big World's Fair pavilion? And then I went, well, wait a minute. This has been staring us in the face the entire time. The World's Fair is in the movie. Yeah, it's right there at the end. (laughs) It's right there. And so the towers became, the towers, and and, and I'm not talking well into production. I'm talking with, you know, the concept phase is probably the first three months. So Mm -hmm. during that is when all of these ideas are going fast and furious. and, 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 um, And then that came up and we're like, oh yeah, let's do that. And so that became an exercise of, well, what is it? Does it it tie directly to those towers or are those a wink at the movie? And so we said, well, let's make it our own world expo pavilion. Um, And that, you know, that, that led to the universe and you that led to, Oh my God, it'd be a funny, it'd be funny to start out and think you're going to that. And you get hijacked and taken down to MIB headquarters. And, and then the end. And so the theme literally became the setup and punchline for non-fans is the, the ride asks you the question, does life exist outside our galaxy? Uh, does, does life exist in outer space? At the end of the ride, the answer is nope. Have a good life. So it's even, even though you've just seen you know, a bunch of them. So it's, it, it, it drives the joke home for people. Are we alone? Out. Of course we are. Of course you know, we are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's hilarious because that you just reminded me of the original Carousel of Progress. Like they were trying for the 1964 World's Fair, they were trying to like leave, leave uh, end on this optimistic note about the future. And General Electric, who was the sponsor, was like, "No, now is the best time." And they had to redo the song. And and, and instead of it being a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, it's like, "Now is the time. Now is yeah. the best time." And, yeah, and so it's exactly <laughs> the same thing. Is there life outside? Nope. <laughs> Nope, sorry. Um, and 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 you know the, the 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 person who wrote the song and all the music was a uh, a really talented composer named Andy Garfield, who's a dear friend of mine, and he studied at USC the School of Composition under Buddy Baker, who was the guy who oh. arranged Miracles Through Molecules and The Great Big mm-hmm. Beautiful Tomorrow and all of that stuff for it's Disney, so perfect. right? Yeah, Buddy Baker is awesome. We wrote that song and uh, me and Tim Bernardi, who was the document controller, who was a real jokester, he and I wrote the lyrics. Um, and then I sort of hummed it through, through the phone to Andy back in LA. And I said, here's what I want. And he did a quick little demo with his, with his samples and his synthesizers. And it's by and large what you hear, like it was pretty perfect. And, um, and I sent it around for approval. Everybody loved it. And it was, everybody really got a good laugh out of everybody. Cause it was you know meant to be funny. And, and then, Andy says, okay, once I get like the rough draft of this and we put in, cause he, he brought in a, an actual three or three, four piece orchestra to get some real instrument sounds and yeah, and some singers to, that were friends of his and blah, blah, blah. He puts it all together. He plays me the sort of first draft unmixed version and it's f-ing fantastic. Pardon my friends. Uh, this is a, this is a family podcast. Um, um, <laughs> we'll fix it in post. <laughs> he plays it for me. <laughs> he plays it for me and I'm blown away. It's amazing. He says, I'm going to play it for Buddy. Oh, whoa. And, and I'm like, oh. wait, what? He's like, he's like, yeah, I have, a, I have an appointment to go see him over on campus. I haven't talked to him in a while. He said, come on over, and I want to play it for him while I'm there. Whoa. And I'm know. like, I'm literally waiting by the phone for like the next two days. And, and Andy calls me, and he says, Buddy stood up and applauded. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, Seal man. of approval. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I I very proudly went to Phil him with that. I went. By the way, Buddy Baker approves of our theme song. He was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> it's so perfect. Um, in yeah. that first scene, it, like it's setting the mood secretly like it has the underlying uh, in between the verses which are hilarious if you listen to the words but there's this um like building music in the background that's also like the mib alien attack theme that like is like doom, 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 doom. like it's almost like men in black the movie but it's its own version for the ride you'll hear it like at the at the yep. load station and stuff that yep. little yep. that little nugget there always like it excites me it gives me chills when i'm waiting in the in the first scene um before the elevator even and i'm like it sets the mood so perfectly because hidden underneath the layer of the fake theme park thing is the actual yeah. story just yeah. waiting to burst out and i love that little touch um yeah yeah i love <laughs> i also love the interruption of it i love uh 
um, Zed Rip was so funny, and he was oh, f- f- sorry about all this phony theme park nonsense. But <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's one of my favorite lines in the whole ride. And I love when I the love greeters Rip. really put them, or the, the characters, the the, the uh, team members that do that part, they really put themselves into it because they'll be like. Um, They'll act like when they hear it turned down and then Zed start talking, they'll act like, oh, these are going to be new recruits. They'll go back, put the sunglasses on and come back out with a gun and be like, congratulations, it, you've been hand selected. Like they're really into I know. it. <laughs> it makes me, that makes me, I cannot tell you how ridiculously happy that makes me that they lean into it. I love, I was, a, I worked, I, I didn't work attractions like rides, but I was a tour guide at Universal Hollywood back in the day in the eighties. And so oh, nice. I, I understand the I understand the camaraderie of working in a theme park. I love, I understand how everybody sort of leans into, you know, the, the thing they're doing and creates their own little family of people. I, and, and, and I, and I can't take credit for like fostering any of that with them. They literally just started doing it themselves. Jason Depew, who was an operator there at the beginning, is now an attraction uh, writer, and I, who I worked with actually worked on the Warner Park with me in Abu Dhabi. Um, but he told me all about it those early years. He's like, "Oh yeah, we our training, we literally treat it like you're in the MIB." And so when it, that comes out to the guest side of things, it makes me so happy because it's very much like when you know you're your butler or maid at the haunted mansion axel mm-hmm. dower and goth like it, it it's the same instinct and i and i i'm so grateful that happened it really adds a lot when um when i got the opportunity to work there uh one of the gags i came up with was um i would you know usher everyone into the elevator and then i'd say as soon as it shut i'd be like i'll meet you down there and then i would go around and be at the exit door of the elevator um holding the gun or whatever they allowed me to hold and then they, the door doors would open and i'd be like so out of breath and i'd be like i took the stairs you guys good luck in your training <laughs> <laughs> and that's it that would be my gag <laughs> oh my god i want to hug you that's amazing that's that's, <laughs> that's that's perfect that's absolutely perfect um, because uh, there'd be just enough time to do that and then run back to the other side and start the next show. Um, so yeah, that was, whew, that was one of my, I, I, I've always wanted to tell you that. Um, so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's my, I'm, I'm giving you the little hand heart thing. Uh, uh, that I did, makes me very happy. I think I was trained there 2000 or, 2000, or 2001, like a year after mm. it opened. Um, and mm-hmm. I did get to take my test on the immigration floor. Uh, like in, in a man, in like a way to make it look like there was some activity. Uh, mm-hmm. like I, and I remember on the big screen every once in a while, it would loop around to like, um, you know, end of the world in three, two, and then crisis averted. I would look up yeah. casually while doing my test and act like I'm almost, you know, concerned. And then when it goes crisis averted, I would look back down to my test. Like, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. That's great. Almost good. concerned. That's so good. That's great. Um, I heard rumors that there was supposed to be animatronics down there in that immigration uh, scene, besides the twins, of course. Uh, there and- were. Um, originally, there was more stuff behind the frosted glass. We were going to have shadow projection, video projectors with shadows of people oh. working and aliens doing funny gags, um, not unlike what's in the new Star Tours queue, like the, the little you mm-hmm. see droids and passengers mm-hmm. and stuff walking by. It was going to be similar to that. And again, it's one of those things that just gets cut for budget and it, it didn't quite fit into the space in terms of the hardware at the time um, video at that time large-scale video projection was still pretty expensive um and the other one was going to be um because you see it in the movie there's aliens that are walking upside down on the underside of the catwalks mm-hmm. um cg aliens obviously but we wanted to have one who had like a clipboard in hand and was like <laughs> looking at something and moving around but we wanted to be underneath the the the, the the entry side. So you didn't see it when you came in. You only saw it as you got to the other side of the room. You look back and go, Oh, there's a dude walking in there. <laughs> and, and, and so there was, it was really just that it was going to be some more, some more shadow play and, and maybe one or two small things. Um, we had talked about that the, at the time of, Oh, could we do a, a tiny little autonomous bot that there's a little alien that scurries across the floor and has a couple of hidey holes that he goes into to charge up. And again, that's something you can do now that was horrifically expensive in 1988. <laughs> so we threw around a lot of ideas like that, but at the end of the day, it just became, it, be, it became, Hey, the, you know, this is a moment where we want people to focus on that screen the most and, and Bob and Bob are the best, uh, uh, are, are the, are the, the, the are the ones that tie you to the movie and remind you what room you're in and why, yeah, which is yeah. the call to act. So. Speaking of the cuts, I was wondering, is there something that really hurt you to cut that you really didn't want to get rid of that you had to let go? 
like um, one thing that really hurt. Yeah, there is. Um, and it was cut for um, budget slash space. And again, it's one of those things where um, we got to a point where there was more limited space for something than the, and it was an, it was a mo- another moving cloth. You notice on the big bug at the end of the ride, mm-hmm. his right claw goes up and down. Well, we had one on the left side too. And the left side one went right over the ride vehicle. Like it was what we call in the business, it's, it's overhead safety. Like the little teeny head that moves is overhead safety. Something that is engineered to be over ride vehicles and over guest heads has a lot more um, scrutiny in its engineering than anything else in a ride because it is a potential safety hazard, right? Yeah. And, and so overhead safety things cost a lot more money. And so that limited space on the right hand side, if you look at the ride now, it's like a wall and almost immediately it's the ride track. So there's very little space that would have had to have been re-engineered to be supported from above, like from the catwalk or something. And we had to cut it and we were all sitting around the, the model. We had a giant model where, um, the track was cut out and the whole model was raised up to shoulder level. So you can literally stand in and your head would be where a ride vehicle was. And it's how we evaluated sight lines. It's how you did things before. Nowadays you do it all in, in VR or a cave or, or just a, um, a CG model and look at, look at viewing angles that way. <laughs> so you had a, you had a had tangible a, previs that you could put your head. Yeah. In. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's, and that's the way, I mean, that's how Disney did that for pirates and, 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 and all a lot, most of their dark rides over the decades. So we did the same and, so we had Neville's giant sculpt of the big bug, which is gorgeous. Um, and that one side was this thing we were talking about. And finally I relented and said, all right, all right, we're cutting it. And I grabbed it out of the model and walked away. And this is where you're going. And I'm like, I'm keeping this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, and so that claw sits on my, on my uh, bookshelf to this day as my trophy for the Aww. thing that got cut out of the ride. Oh, you got your claw anyway. <laughs> you physically cut it right out and kept it. <laughs> and I said, this is, this is mine now. <laughs> um, going back to the queue, um, across from or right next to the break area with the worm guys, there's door gags that barely yeah. anyone knows about. Who, who came yeah. up with the door gags and thank you? <laughs> uh, because- that, was, that was me. That was me. And that was just like, you know, we talked about how a queue is both time-wasting and story. But also we wanted to introduce a little bit of agency. You know, the, the, everybody loves the Indiana Jones queue with the, 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 the don't, don't pull the bamboo pole and don't tug on the rope. And mm-hmm. that originally had, you know, five or six more of those moments that didn't make it like don't step on the diamond shape, shape stones. And there was more of that uh, in concept that got cut for various reasons. But we said, you know, we really need some of that. Um, and so we tried to add that wherever we could. And the, that hallway became a real candidate for it. Um, it, the queue doesn't often back up that far, which is one of the, the yeah, things I probably would, would change. I probably would have put them later on. I probably would have put them in the in the weapons room or something. Um, but yeah, that was just an attempt to like, let's give guests something to poke at yeah, to make the so, world more real. And Anyone listening, uh, if you're walking through the serpentine hallway after the elevator, on the right side are some doors. <laughs> one says fingerprint removal. If you jiggle the handle, it'll zap you. It goes bzzz. Um, the other one's what airlock and it like blows air out. Something oxygen. It's like oxygen free zone or something. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and you, and you do it and you hear, you hear like a sucking alien noise and and you get blasted with air. Oh, it's good. Good stuff. Universal's really good at the, Universal's really good at the terrifying blasts of air. (laughs) And there's also a cork board there with hilarious things that are like lived in to create the universe, like more, like a more believable place. So just sit there and read everything and, Try the door. There's like a reset time on those door handles too, like a good minute or so, yeah. so that no yeah, one else yeah, can keep because, doing it. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. And those, um, and that bulletin board with all of the stuff on it is various team members. Like I said to everybody on the team, like make me a funny for sale thing or, or uh, <laughs> help wanted or something. Like that's something you would put up in the employee break room here. And so that's awesome. that was that was everybody submitted ideas, and then me and Tim Bernardi, again the document control guy, who's a real clown ended up writing all of them. So um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, random question. It just occurred to me um, with all the, the, the pre-show, the cue videos and stuff. Um, there's one where the two different types of guns, the zappers are being explained and it's like, Oh, it's mm-hmm. a noisy cricket version two, And then the other one's the series four alienator. Why does mm-hmm. Zed call it jumbo Judy? <laughs> <laughs> That's just a, <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> and, and I think I 
think Jay actually says, oh, it's a long story. You don't want to hear it. Like, what? what's the yeah. story? That was um, that was just one of the comedy punch up moments. Like after we wrote the plot of the, of, uh, I wrote the first draft of that. We were like, let's punch this up. And I had a friend of mine, Sean Abley, who was a comedy writer in LA. He ended up sort of punching up, and that was one of his gags. And I loved it, and it always made everybody laugh in the room when we, when we read it. Um, so it was just ridiculous. And 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 you know, you you get the feeling that Zed as a character is a bit of a potty mouth and 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 a, you know and a, and a and a and a ruffian in a way. And so I I thought it was perfect for him. And he again even even he chuckled when he when we did this this, this table read with him. He was like he got a laugh out of him, which made me happy. But you know, a lot of a lot of the um, stuff that Will did, we scripted it, but we also when we sent him the script, we're like you know you tell us how you want to change this You're, you know, cause he, he said, uh, you know, I'm going to bring my, one of my writers along. Is that okay? We're like, yeah, sure. Oh, nice. Cause that's, that's your stock and trade in, in movies is, you know, you, you bring this le- level of comedy. So everything from the moment, the stuff he says in the pre-show to the stuff, he's the, the versions of the endings of the different scores, mm-hmm. that's all him. Like I told him we, we had X number of versions. I forget what the number is of high, middle, low, and the various iterations, both low, both middle, both high, high and low, high and middle, middle and middle. You know what I mean? Like I gave him, here's the number we need. And here's the idea behind each one. You're telling one vehicle they did great and the other they did awful or one or both that you did, or both that you did terrible. Or both I would you describe you okay. all as woo and you all as woo. And you all as woo, woo, yeah. woo, woo, woo. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's that's entirely him. Like we wrote none, we wrote none of that. We, we, we got pure Will Smith for that. And my favorite one, he's like, you all over here were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you all over here were like, ah, oh, they shooting, they shooting. You know? <laughs> I don't think I've ever gotten that one. <laughs> oh, it's really, it's, it's really funny. They're all pretty great. Um, and that's my next question, multiple endings and, and, you know, not just multiple endings. No one ever talks about it. There's actually multiple like voiceover phrases throughout the ride too, or at least two points of the ride that I could think of. Um, Mm -hmm. maybe three, uh, uh, like that's something that was new. I don't think Buzz Lightyear has something like that. Like Buzz Lightyear has the, the three different score levels. Like you have the galaxy defender, cosmically average and bug bait, but it doesn't have something like so many different combinations. The two, you know, left, right, right side animatronic endings. And then the, Mm -hmm. you know, Will Smith talking, even at the very end, depending on whether, what three levels you get, Will Smith, when he neuralizes, you said something different, you know, like that's pretty hot too bad. You're not going to remember any of it as he would ever see so um but (laughs) like that that was um is it just two times during now 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 i want to ask during the ride um now that's what i'm talking about mib material like that's after the uh, alleyway scene and the other one is um right after the the real training session is there any more that changed throughout the attraction or is that the only two I think it's those only. I think it's those two, and then the, the finale moments. I don't remember offhand to be honest, okay. but we did realize that there were moments where, like, we can the the, the the onboard vehicle system knows the score of everybody at any given moment. So we tried to find moments that were dramatically appropriate, like a big show, showdown with one of the bigger characters. The calm down moment after that could be either encouragement or chiding you for not doing well enough. And so that was just a, a, a we knew we had that the audio cueing was, could be tied to the score. Um, and that was an easy thing to do because of the game system. So that was that, that's why that decision happened. And then at the ending, it just makes sense that yeah. it was one of the big things we wanted to do different than Buzz Lightyear because it was multiple endings. And so how that came about with those three different, with basically the blank hallway, that was just um, a lot of spitballing of how to make a ending visually different three different ways but in the same space and so we did it as simply as possible and used the vehicle pivot as the the way to tell that story so it's it's the simplest gag ever it's just two scrims really the hardest one to figure out was what to say what to say when you've got you know um bug bait and it was just an empty hallway Um, Uh, yeah okay i was gonna ask what's the third thing so there's actually a lower level than seeing the boss (laughs) um i think I think I don't recall the old, the, the, the old level was, yes, you only faced forward and it was the sound of crickets. And, and, <laughs> and, that and, is perfect. and Will's voice, Will, Will's voice, like, well, uh, I guess you got to try again or something. I forget what it was. And we played around with it. If I'm, if now that you jog my memory, I think what happened was we realized that it was a real letdown Yeah. so that yes, there are three scores levels, 
there are three rankings and there used to be three different endings and bug bait was an empty hallway. And, okay. and if you notice the way that hallway's lit, it's lit with like down lights on the wall. Mm-hmm. Well, those patterns of the down lights are painted on the scrim as well to look like, you know, a hallway Whoa. of lights. Right. Um, and so the idea was to just show that uh, facing forward, but it was way too subtle. And the room is so plain because it's just these black walls and this, the, the, uh, the score ranking names in front of you that it, it didn't really play. So we ended up saying, all right, everybody below a certain level gets the coach. Okay. <laughs> Basically you zigged when you should have zagged. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for the crickets. I think that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, like if you had never <laughs> yeah. done the ride before though, you wouldn't know that there's o- other alternative right. options. So that's, that would be your first again, experience. <laughs> right. And that goes back to, it's got to work for everybody. It's got to work for. And so at the end of the day, what do I want? Do I want to tell people they failed or do I want to encourage them to go again? So that's why we defaulted on the coach. Oh, uh, okay. I think it was a good choice, but that is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I want to know who, who did the doofus and do right animation. Oh, stuff, like drawing yeah. and stuff. I love that. I love, I love doofus and do right. Like, yeah. you know, I'm a child of the seventies. So highlights for children magazine in the doctor's office was, mm-hmm. you know, ingrained, ingrained in my head. And so, um, if you don't, if people don't know, that's a, a magazine for kids that was often in doctor's offices. And there's a section in it called goofus and gallant and goofus and gallant were basically a comic strip about manners. And it was like, you know, goofus does things the wrong way. Gallant does things the right way. And, and it's very fifties. It's very 50 sixties. It's real corny. And so, I, uh, that was that was initially my idea. I said I think that I, I want to do a training film in the style of that. In the style of that, um, the animation style uh, and, and the, all of the animation, all the video animation in the ride was done by Sound Deluxe, which was uh, right across the street from um, Universal Florida. Um, God, I forget which. It's like kind of right behind the site. There's a little teeny industrial park there with a bunch of post-production offices. I don't know if Sound Deluxe is still there, but they're a local company in Orlando that does audio and video production and hard and audio system design, video system design, audio engineering. And they had a very small animation team. And so they did all of that there. And they pitched me this idea of this very sort of googie style of things. And I just fell in love with it. That I, I am so proud of that safety film. It's one of, I think, the best things in the ride. And it's that example of how do you take the vibe of MIB that you know from the movies and the sense of humor from MIB that you know from the movies and extend it into, you know, lateral content and create something new out of it. It feels so much part of the world, but like this vintage thing that they've had forever, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. And if you, 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 you do know, if you look closely um, and the, the vehicle that gets um, when doofus mistakenly takes a flash picture, um, there is a, uh, that vehicle with doofus has one passenger who is um, a little bit on the larger side with a beard. And that is a caricature of me in a Hawaiian shirt. So nice. um, uh, that was snuck in. I didn't even realize it until like we were well into production and the artists go, you know, that's you. I'm like, what? Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's incredible how you guys ended up going with the World's Fair aesthetic because it ties everything together so well yeah. with the like yeah. uh, 50s, 60s retro MIB stuck in the past and then the actual yeah. uh, uh, flying ships, the spaceships uh, from Flushing outside and like mm-hmm. the, the whole style, the Universe of You song and everything. So perfect. Were you one of the people that uh, um, that were mind blown when I mentioned that one of the one of the spaceships was broken off the tower earlier this year. Did you go see that whole, th- that whole Twitter thread? I did thread? see the whole Twitter thread, but I was, people kept pointing it out to me and I kept responding with, yeah, that's the way it's always been. Cause there was this weird, all of a sudden conspiracy <laughs> that it had been yeah. removed. And I'm like, nope. no, that's the gag guys. Seriously. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to look like it, it was removed in the movie. Remember the movie? It happened. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, I was blown away that people never saw that. It kind of made me happy that they never saw it, but it, I was also like, Hmm. The, the things people don't notice. You know? <laughs> no, no, I love that. That that's part of it. Um, I also love the way it looks at night. The whole building with the like uh, oh. the dancing neon going back and forth. Uh, it's that's beautiful. great stuff. That's uh, that's was a relatively new tech at the time called Flow Neon. Um, it is real neon. It's not LED. And it and neon has this funny thing where you can either turn on power on both ends at the same voltage because you know they're basically tubes with electrical connections at the end. 
But somebody figured out if you modify the voltage from one side to the other, the, the light will whoop, shoot down it like a like it's a so blob smooth. <laughs> yeah, it's so it is an analog lighting effect that is actual neon gas moving. That's not that's not wow. like an LED thing. It's it's really beautiful. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, that and the, then there's the little sparkly strobes for a little star feel in the, on the mm-hmm. wall, and then just the colors, all the lighting. Um, our light, our lighting designer was a guy named Norm Schwab from a company called light switch. And he is a brilliant genius lighting designer who, uh, can take all the credit for not only the exterior, but the color story inside the building and, and the way the sets are lit, everything that the, one of the lighting was one of those things that really, uh, ties a lot of things together. And he vibed with the design in a really profound way. And I think brought the building and the ride to life. I'm forever grateful because he's a, a genius, genius lighting designer. Um, was there going to be a restaurant? People always talk about, uh, the concept of a restaurant and there's tons of YouTube videos where people are like, look, there's an M over the gift shop and there's an I on the restrooms and the B is missing. Yep. Where's the B that must've been where the restaurant goes. So for the it record, was. it was, yes, for the record, it was the, um, um, uh, the, the architect who did the building outside of the building is uh, Canner and associates out of LA. They, they're very known for, um, some very prominent LA architecture that was sort of googie 60s revival. Like there's an In-N-Out Burger in Westwood that they did. If you look it up, it's this very cool googie thing. It was built in like the early 90s. So they leaned heavily into the time period. And yes, the where the restrooms are now was going to be a restaurant. And it was sort of, if you took a letter B, it was the top of the B. And the idea was from a certain angle, standing on either the bridge in front of um, back to the future or further across the water, you would see the reflection of the building down below and mm-hmm. then the B would then complete. Do you know what I mean? It would be a so mirror half image a of the B. Okay. Right. And so that was the, that was the subtle idea. And we looked at it and it was a, it was really difficult to make it work. Well, B the park decided um, they didn't need the food capacity. C it didn't fit in the budget. So it was just a, it was a, it was cut pretty early on, but yes, there was a, um, MIB commissary basically planned, but we never got past concept. So we never designed anything like oh, okay. interiors or food or drinks or anything. It was, it was cut way before we finalized. Or <laughs> well, you can do like the, uh, uh, sequel and have it Burger King in there. Um, <laughs> do you remember they, they added Burger King yeah. into the uh, immigration floor, um, in that movie, uh, uh yeah. MIB two doesn't exist in my mind. Um, no, thank you. It's <laughs> not very good. I, I, I love the third one. Yeah. Third one's great. Um, the final bug, and before I ask the other question, Wikipedia thinks the final bug is Edgar for some reason. No, not true. Yeah, it is. Its name is Babs, it is, it, right? It's Babs. <laughs> it's short for big ass bug. Yeah. Um, um, uh, it, it, and I think Babs is actually the name Babs is actually hidden on one of the info screens projected in uh, uh, Times Square. I think maybe I don't, maybe we didn't get away with that, but. Um, no, it, it, I mean, they're design cues like Edgar in terms of the color scheme and in terms of it being, you know, giant claws and eyes like a cockroach, but it is not supposed to be Edgar incarnate. That's yeah. Not, that's Bugs not. is a common thing. Like we got a bug, you know, da- yeah, downtown, right. like that's a common thing yeah. in the MIB world. So this, but yeah, this yeah, also yeah. it's quite big. He's much bigger. Um, yeah. So big, yeah. in fact, he swallows the vehicle. You know, <laughs> yeah, two vehicles. <laughs> yeah, not, not just not just Tommy Lee Jones, but two ride vehicles. Yes. Um, is there? I, I kind of faintly remember seeing something. It might have been your channel on YouTube. Is there a time capsule or something yeah. hidden inside of the big bug? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Um, near the end of production, uh, we took a bunch of photos from the team and from the project, and we took a couple of our construction badges and some swag and um, put it all into uh, a little canister and shoved it into the, um, the wire framework that was being shot created over for the, uh, um, uh, to become bad. So it's hidden. If you're on the ride, it's right in the, like you see like a soft palette underneath in the mouth. That's right below the little tiny head that moves. It's basically in that general area. So when they, uh, when they dismantle the ride years from now, uh, (laughs) someone will find it and it's probably all faded at this point but we did do it oh so it's hidden behind awesome. concrete that's been sprayed on so it's not accessible mm-hmm. okay no not that's, accessible at all not unless you chip away at something yeah. <laughs> that's awesome um yeah. that uh someday um 
No, no, no. I, I, I changed my statement. It's never going to be seen because the ride is never going to close. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, it's, it's funny. Somebody asked me that a while back on the, you know, how does it feel to have it turn 20? And I said, well, first, it makes me feel old. Secondly, um, <laughs> it, you know, I look at the influence of a, of a ride like Haunted Mansion on me is it is impossible to understate. Right. Like I have a, I have a tattoo about the high mansion for Christ's sakes. Like I, that going through that ride at four years old was a formative experience. And so when you look at when Hound of Mansion opened, it was what, 1967, right? So when I was a fan of that ride, which was in the late seventies, early eighties is when I first started getting an annual pass. So we're talking, you know, roughly 20 years into the Haunted Mansion's run is when I imprinted on it even harder than when I did as a kid. And it already seemed like a classic to me then. So I look at men in black now and go, there are people that rode that ride (laughs) as kids when we opened that are having the same enjoyment of it in the way that I enjoyed the haunted mansion thinking it was a classic. And so it's really humbling to me. Like I, we, you don't go into these things expecting them to last forever or even that they'll be culturally relevant. Right. And so the fact that it has stuck around and has all these fans is uh, I can't even tell you how gratifying that is for me and for the whole team. Like it's, it really to be seen in the echelon of 20 year old attractions is a very short list of things. And, uh, and we're very, very proud to have, uh, to have, to be part of that tiny club. When um, the MIB international was gearing up to go into theaters, they actually revamped and fixed a lot of the effects that hadn't been on in years uh, oh, some good. some aliens that hadn't been working. A lot of lighting got upgraded. Um, oh, great! Especially in the first two scenes of the actual like New York sets, and the uh-huh. big screen got replaced. All the ends uh, projections got replaced, and it's oh, great good. to see some love put into it. And it's it, it, all the Q videos have been remastered for HD. Like it's oh great! It's looking really good. I think the only thing that feels a little bit two thousand y still is the yeah. were the 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 aliens for the other car screen. Like that one screen, oh, and it right. may just be that they yep. don't want to put the money up to re-render the footage to actually redo. Right. Um, right. So you're playing old. It kind of reminds me of the Cat in the Hat has that very 2000 CG look for that one little yeah. screen. And it's like, whoa, yeah. whoa. So yeah. <laughs> if, uh, bearing that one little moment, like the ride feels just as fresh and good and new as it always wow. has. So like I'm that's, very that's, I'm very flattered by that. Thank I you. think I think it's good for another twenty years, honestly. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I hope they hope they want to hold so. on to it. At the same token, you know, if they announce tomorrow that it's gone, I will be grateful that it ran at the time it did, as long as it did with the fans that it did. So I yeah. will, I hope they keep it around. And I, I hope, you know, I was hoping with the Men of Black International, I thought, you know, I was hoping that there'd be renewed interest in the series. I didn't dislike that movie, but it didn't land, I think, the way it could have. Right. And 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 I and I don't think it, it bears any any need to upgrade the ride beyond what it is. But man, wouldn't it be great if you know they went through the whole thing with a fine tooth comb and upgraded all the tech and put in projection on mapping and all the stuff we've been talking about? Like I would love to see that happening. It's probably unlikely because it really boils down to you know the license with Sony and, and how much longer Sony will let them pay for it. Frankly, they could uh, say nope, we're done. We want to be in the in the theme park industry ourselves or something. Who knows? You know. Um, and, uh, uh, but Universal is holding on to it because it's a people eater, you know, it's a high capacity ride. It's a high satisfaction it, ride, you know, people, it, it people rates like it over and over again. It rates really high in every exit poll. And on top of that, I think one of the biggest reasons is it appeals to everybody, right? It's not a thrill ride. It's not just a kid's ride. It's not just a family ride. It's all of those things. And no offense, uh, but it's not a screen ride. <laughs> right. right, <laughs> so right, right, right. They kind of need it for numbers. physical stuff. Yeah. Right, right, right. So, but okay, I think that's going to wrap up our discussion. Um, thank you okay, so great. much uh, for, for being course. here. Uh, Dave Cobb, you can find him on YouTube and on the Twitter. Where else are you uh, located? YouTube, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram, all as Dave Cobb. Ah, so it's super easy to find you. Um, you. Type in MIB if you get some other Dave Cobb, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a famous music <laughs> producing Dave Cobb, Grammy award winning Dave Cobb that I get mistweeted at all the time. But <laughs> He, he and I a, did you not no, get a Grammy for the laugh. universe in you you wrote the lyrics come on 
No, no. And it's funny. He, I've actually reached out to him a couple of times and we've had a nice laugh on DMs on Twitter because <laughs> he's really, really well known. Like he produces, he produced the soundtrack to Star is Born with Lady Gaga. Like he's huge. Oh, wow. Yeah. And yeah. And so we've had a good laugh about it. And we said, well, eventually when this all ends, let's all, let's have coffee in LA and break the internet someday. Um, <laughs> Dave Cobb's Post a picture unite. of us. And, yeah, <laughs> Cobbception. Have a Cobb salad. Okay, I'm sorry. I walked myself out. <laughs> oh, oh, I resisted that one. No, no, no. Bad. It was a Los Angeles thing. I'm sorry. I couldn't help but tie it all together. Oh. I, uh, I, I like a good dad joke. I'm much appreciated. <laughs> oh, even I resisted that bad joke. Come I on. know, Ian. This is supposed to be your job. <laughs> Wait, I have a thing. There we go. Oh. Uh, and on that note okay <laughs> all right thank you so much guys <laughs> thanks for having me on oh thank you thanks dave it's awesome talking to you man all right we'll talk later <laughs> promises promises